Hello everyone, I'm Danny Rowdy of DannyRowdy.com, and I recently posted a new article on my web blog entitled Recharging the Mosaic Cycle. Before I get into it, I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting my work, and you can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash dannyrowdy. One of my favorite films of 2014 was The Internet's Own Boy, a film that chronicled the life and death of boy genius and anti-authoritarian activist Aaron Swartz. Almost immediately after the film was over, I remember reaching out to my friend Karen to tell her how much I enjoyed the film. Halfway into our conversation, we both noted that Aaron had a great head of hair, and Karen went on to say that she noticed that Aaron's hair seemed to dim during the times of the film that the documentary discussed Aaron's digestive ailment, Crohn's disease. The connection between hair and health is not fringe, and has been widely discussed over the last few decades. As early as 1993, it was known that baldness was associated with developing heart disease. Later, baldness was found to be related to other problems like metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol, reduced bone mineral density, and cancer. The evidence that hair growth and health are interconnected doesn't appear to have penetrated the mainstream, and instead you're likely to be blunted over the head with an endless array of pseudo-intellectual blowhards progressing the idea that baldness is simply the result of bad genes and excess masculinity. Their science comprises of rattling off model after model of ever-growing complexity that is divorced from the individual and their environment. This compartmentalized anti-science approach to hair loss is often reflected in the phases of the hair growth cycle or mosaic cycle. Hair follicles go through a cyclical growth phase composed of three phases, antigen, the phase of active growth, catagen, the phase of regression, and telogen, the resting period. The proportion of antigen follicles is highest in childhood and lowest in old age, and there are small, relatively constant variations in different regions of the scalp. When a hormone or drug is said to increase the antigen growth of hair, sometimes the substance is deemed good or useful for hair growth. For example, finasteride can increase the antigen growth of hair follicles, but also may be carcinogenic. Similarly, the hormone-like unsaturated fatty acid breakdown product prostaglandin E2, or PGE2, is said to promote antigen growth and is also associated with cancer. Substances that promote growth like finasteride or PGE2 stimulate mitosis, which might appear to have a positive effect on hair growth while having a negative systemic effect on the organism. Thus, I think it's important to attempt to understand the overall physiology of the balding person and hair growth rather than identifying substances that simply promote antigen growth. Similar to bone marrow, skin, intestine, and other highly proliferative glucose-dependent tissues, the hair follicle is composed of rapidly dividing cells that convert more than 85% of their glucose to lactic acid via glycolysis or fermentation. When the various glucose pathways are studied in growing and resting follicles, the metabolic activities are found to be much higher during the growing antigen phase. For example, in the growing follicle, glucose utilization increases 200%, glycolysis increases 200%, the activity of the pentose phosphate cycle 800%, metabolism by other pathways 150%, and AT production via the respiratory chains 270%. In the bowl portion of the growing follicles, the activity of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6-PDH, a key enzyme and rate-limiting factor of the pentose phosphate cycle increased 350% over that in resting follicles. Clearly, by activating the pentose phosphate cycle, glucose assimilation in growing hair follicles produces not only sufficient energy for itself, but also essential substances like the electron carrier NADPH. Two important functions of NADPH is to help produce steroids within the hair follicle and to provide reducing power to recycle reduced glutathione, GSSG, back to glutathione, GSH, protecting the hair follicle from oxidative damage. A decrease in antigen to telogen hairs, mainly in the frontal parietal region, is a major symptom of male pattern baldness. In 1999, Adachi et al. found that G6-PDH activity decreased in direct relationship with the decreasing ratio of antigen hairs. In fact, the researchers suggested that G6-PDH could be a suitable marker for diagnosis of alopecia, 
and that energy metabolism may be a new strategy to prevent and cure male pattern baldness. A decrease in the activity of G6PDH increases the ratio of NADP to NADPH. As the availability of NADPH declines, GSSG cannot be recycled back into GSH to protect the hair follicle from oxidative stress. In 2015, a group found that balding dermal papilla cells have significantly higher concentrations of GSSG compared to occipital dermal papilla cells, and that the balding hair follicles appear to be less able to handle oxidative stress. The group concluded the abstract with, there may be a role for oxidative stress in the pathogenesis of male pattern baldness. If supporting energy metabolism can be thought of as a strategy for preventing and curing so-called male pattern baldness, as Adachi et al. suggested, I think it's important to look at factors in the environment that contribute to the decreasing the activity of G6PDH and the production of NADPH. Unsaturated fatty acids have increased 1,000-fold from 1909 to 1999 and have a dominant position in the world's food supply. In addition to being a precursor for the prostaglandin Garza et al. discovered accumulated in the scalps of balding men and inhibited hair growth, they appear to be inhibitors of G6PDH. In one experiment, rats were switched from a non-fat diet to one containing 15% unsaturated fatty acids, and there was an eightfold decrease in the level of G6PDH. When the rats fasted for two days and were fed a high carbohydrate, non fat diet, the activity of G6PDH increased to an amount larger than that of the normal fed state. In contrast to the unsaturated fats, adding saturated fats, palmitate or sterate, or a monounsaturated fat, oleate, does not inhibit or inhibits G6PDH activity to a lesser degree, suggesting that in the inhibition of G6PDH is not solely a consequence of reduced carbohydrate intake. In an experiment with rodents, 20% of calories from safflower oil inhibited the activity of G6PDH to a greater degree than 20% of calories from beef tallow. Similar to safflower oil, the so-called essential fatty acids were found to inhibit G6PDH activity too. In comparison to the inhibitory effect of the polyunsaturated fats, carbohydrates appear to stimulate G6PDH activity. The greatest change in G6PDH activity is observed when rats are fed diets containing glucose or fructose, compared with starch, and stimulation by fructose is greater than by glucose. In diabetic rats, fructose increased the activity of G6PDH more than glucose suggesting that it might be the most useful carbohydrate for increasing G6PDH activity. The microinflammatory process of baldness suggests that the hair follicle is undergoing stress, and the energy requirements for highly proliferative tissues are amplified in stress. For example, in three-day-old wounds, the activities of glycolytic enzymes increase four times over normal levels. There is a five-fold increase in oxygen uptake, and the rate of lactate production is tripled. G6PDH activity triples in psoriasis, increases fivefold in tumors and hyperplasia, and sevenfold in the epidermis during wound healing. There is a 50% increase in glucose flow along the pentose phosphate pathway during wound healing. Sugars stimulate the hormone insulin, an inducer of G6PDH. In rats, when insulin levels drop, there is a concaminate drop in G6PDH activity, and when animals are fed, G6PDH activity is restored. Moreover, administration of insulin alone increased G6PDH enzyme in a dose-dependent manner. It was proposed in Montagna's epic, The Biology of Hair Growth, that insulin, and not glucose, might be the critical factor in the growth of the hair follicles. In addition to inducing G6PDH, insulin activates another regulator of G6PDH, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is essential for the initiation as well as the maintenance of hair growth, and the main effect of this hormone is to preserve the antigen state. Low thyroid function is associated with an increase in the percentage of telogen to antigen hairs, as well as a higher level of total cholesterol. In 2010, it was found that men and women with androgenic alopecia, or male pattern baldness, had higher levels of cholesterol, and that the anomalous lipid values may contribute alongside with other mechanisms to the development of cardiovascular disease in patients with androgenic alopecia. Both thyroid hormones, T2 and T3, increase activity of G6PDH in hypothyroid rats, and G6PDH 
activity was elevated in patients with thyrotoxicosis. As I've mentioned previously, Vidal et al. called for a repositioning of thyroid hormone as mitochondrial hair medicine in 2013. Insulin and thyroid hormone tend to shift the metabolism away from the oxidation of free fatty acids and the production of the adaptive stress hormones and toward the constructive use of sugar. A lowered rate of metabolism or the stress metabolism and not bad genes or an excess of masculinity, I think is the most coherent explanation for the development of pattern baldness in both men and women. Thank you for listening. You can find all the references to this article on my website at dannyrowdy.com. I appreciate you listening, and a special thanks to the patrons that make all of my work possible. And uh, check out the podcast, Generative Energy. It comes out weekly, and it's with my friend Georgie or Karen. And uh, I had a recent episode with Ray Pete as well. Thanks for listening. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Also, leave any comments in the comment section. And thanks for listening.